With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning and thank you for joining us today here on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, a look at this year's snow levels and how they stack up. Plus, we'll have this week's almond update. But we start today with Brian German. West Region Sales Agronomist for AgroLiquid Abe Isaac joins us today to talk about the use of soil and tissue tests in helping shape nutrition plans. Soil tests are a tool in your toolbox. I use them, I don't want to overemphasize them, but you need to pull them. Uh, they are a report card of what you have done. They're not a great predictor of what's going to happen in the future. So you've always got to have that in the, in the back of your mind and what you're looking at. But it will tell you what I'm doing and what I have done so far this year. Is it where I want it to be? One of the things, too, is, is that even though you can, you can look at a soil, a tissue test, and we'll use the task as an example. You can go in there and uh, let's say in, in April you pull a tissue test and you say, okay, where, where's my numbers? Well, I want to be at about 2, 2.5 uh, percent potassium in there and you're not quite there you know that you're going to put more potassium on for the year you get into june and july and you're starting to see that crop load really starting to go and your numbers aren't quite where you want them to be that plant is pulled a lot of that potassium out of there if you know what you've done with in the past and the history of it uh during the season i i would not panic about that i mean if, if that's starting to be drawn down that's a good thing and I see that all the time on uh, tissue tests and growers are going, wow, I need to add potassium. Look at your plant. Your plant will also tell, tell you what you're looking at. I mean, what's going on. Uh, I tell growers all the time, hey, take that piece of paper that you're looking at, just pull it down about six inches and look up at that tree. That tree looks good. It's growing well. Don't panic. You're in good shape. But it is a, like I said, it is an excellent tool for telling you where you've been. And it can, it can show you some deficiencies as well, especially early on when you're looking at some micros and your zinc and boron, uh, manganese, for instance. If you're low and you're looking at that in, in April, uh, in May, yeah, then it's the time to go in there and address those, some of those issues. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. After more than 40 days of testimony, the federal milk marketing order hearings wrapped up in Carmel, Indiana. Chad Smith has more on the final round of testimony from the American Farm Bureau. The American Farm Bureau Federation offered the final piece of testimony at the federal milk marketing order hearings. Danny Munch, an economist with the American Farm Bureau, talks about what the testimony covered. American Farm Bureau Federation requested an emergency implementation of the switch back to the higher of class one formula back in the 2018 Farm Bill. There was a stipulation that included a switch from the higher of class three and four skim milk price to the average of class three and four skim milk price. And what that's done in the recent years is smoothed the benefit between two prices and in times where the price spread is less than a dollar 48 cents it benefits producers but in periods where the spread is more than a dollar and 48 cents it creates negative pool losses which results in lower milk checks he says farmers have seen significant pool losses in recent years due to high spreads between the class three and class four prices in december 2023 we surpassed over a billion dollars in pool losses related to the formula change in november that was 50 million dollars alone and in december of 2023 that was 38 million dollars alone. So farmers are still feeling the pinch of the switch that occurred under the 2018 Farm Bill. We read a letter into the public hearing record requesting USDA to implement an emergency switch back to the higher of so that farmers don't face those pool losses for another month. Munch says there's still a long way to go in the reform process. This is only step five in a 12-step process. So we still have a lot of days left in this process. Stakeholders still have to submit post-hearing briefs. So we're looking at months and months until a chance for any changes for dairy farmers to see will come into fruition. Farm Bureau says each month the process continues will open up farmers to more negative pool losses due to the average of Class 1 mover formula. For more information, go to fb.org. Chad Smith, Washington. Don't forget if you've missed any of our morning shows or if you just want to catch the news at a different time, you can subscribe to our podcast and have statewide agriculture news at your convenience. Just search for the Agnet News Hour on your favorite podcast downloading app. That's Agnet News Hour, and it is available on both Android and Apple devices. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we will be back in just a moment.
You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. In today's national spotlight, a new corn genetic vulnerability was found affected by an herbicide. David Geiger has this report. Topiralate is an herbicide that's only been commercially available for about six years. It's part of the HPPD class and is used in all types of cornfields to deal with several important broadleaf and grass weeds, including pigweed. However, there is a new genetic vulnerability, and some corn lines are affected. Marty Williams with USDA Agricultural Research Service Global Change and Photosynthesis Research Unit in Illinois was contacted by a seed company two years ago when they saw injury from topirlate. The basis of knowledge of what we have about corn sensitivity to other HPBD inhibitors, they'd already been screened for that. So they thought they knew it was tolerant to existing chemistry, but then it was severely injured by topirlate. And those injury symptoms are actually bleached corn leaves. This is a genetic vulnerability that has never been reported before. Williams began to study it with university and industry colleagues. It's probably the first report of a corn sensitivity to a corn herbicide uh, in over 30 years. And so this brand new uh, genetic vulnerability, we're still trying to identify exactly how it occurs. What Williams thought was isolated to one company and one inbred ended up being much larger. As they mapped sensitivity, they found 49 corn lines affected in both field and sweet corn. It's very interesting because one of the sweet corn lines is Illinois 677A, which is the source of the sugar enhancer trait for sweet corn. It's one of the major endosperm mutants that's really important for high quality sweet corn. Well, the line that introduced that trait to sweet corn is highly sensitive to topirolite. It's very difficult to test each chemistry with each hybrid. Williams felt compelled to get the information out. Just to raise awareness of, hey, there's, there's something new going on here, and, and it is really new. But then also to continue studying this to figure out um, exactly what the mechanism is and to have both the manufacturer of topirolate as well as the seed companies have them begin to think about this and maybe they need to look and, and screen some of their germplasm. This was a shock. Williams says the corn distributors and chemical companies involved with the affected products were completely unrelated. This is a great example of value of public research because we were able to step in between here both the seed companies and herbicide manufacturers and fill in this knowledge gap where uh, you know, the seed companies wouldn't have had access to the herbicide until it was commercialized. Certainly the herbicide manufacturer doesn't have access to all the corn germplasm that is used in the world, but we're able to bridge this divide and, and come up with some useful knowledge that helps them, which helps growers. HPPD inhibitors like topirolate are being explored for new active ingredients, so future products may need additional scrutiny. The seed for inbred corn lines damaged by topirolate come from sources like the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, the University of Missouri, and the National Plant Germplasm System. I'm David Geiger reporting. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's Will Jordan with this Livestock Report. In today's Livestock News, California's Proposition 12, which has national and international impacts, will take a lot of work to overturn. California Assembly Republican Leader James Gallagher explains how that would take place. It would have to go back to the voters. So even if we in the legislature did, it would have to go back to the voters. I think it's definitely worth consideration, something to look at. Hey, can we tweak this in a way at, or you know, at least reform this in a way that actually is workable? Gallagher says at a minimum, the law should be tweaked to not penalize out-of-state farmers. I'm tired of our own farmers getting penalized in California. We've been fighting back against that. But now when you're like hurting farmers in other states, and at the end of the day, you're hurting the consumer. I think that's what we really got to drive home is like now we're hurting consumers and the availability of food at a reasonable price to those consumers. I think really kind of driving home that message and talking to people throughout California, that could have an effect that we could you know, maybe make change there and create a, a better policy. But it's a heavy burden. Gallagher says the U.S. Supreme Court got the ruling wrong. I really wish the Supreme Court would have decided that case in the way that I think they should have. This is clearly discrimination between states. A state has the ability to pass policy for its own state, but it can't, in effect, pass policy in other states. Unfortunately, that's not how it came out. So I think, one, we do need to try and see if we can maybe get that back up to the Supreme Court and get it hopefully overturned. <laughs> but then in the meantime, yeah, each state, I think, working in its own way to help people understand these policies really impact food, that they really impact the ability of farmers to get you nutritious food at a reasonable cost.
In other livestock news, the recent Dairy Strong Conference in Green Bay, Wisconsin, covered several topics important to the U.S. dairy industry. Tim Trotter, CEO of Dairy Business Association, says the industry is watching as the federal milk marketing order hearings get closer to wrapping up. I mean, obviously, this is still on farmers' minds. What is the net going to be for farms? And obviously, they're just winding up the hearings, and it'll probably be several months before we get anything back out of AMS with what the secretary is thinking. But, you know, I think one of the takeaways I have, there's not a united voice. There's not consensus as we thought there might be. But again, it's a very diverse industry. There's so many geographical challenges a lot of different regions have, so they have their reasons, their business case for why they like or dislike something. Trotter is also CEO of Edge Dairy Cooperative and says the co-op is proposing more flexibility in the FMMOs. We need to rethink this and how we look at federal orders, and you know we're really advocating for flexibility for all the orders so that they can be viable for the people they serve. So Federal Order 30, Upper Midwest, little that's being talked about in the federal order hearings right now is going to have any major good impact on us. You know, we were hoping for more risk management tools so farmers can manage their risk, but really for us to think out of the box, we need to have more authority at the federal order level, each order level to have more independence and be able to innovate and think of ways that they could be a value add. I'm Will Jordan for Agnet West. Keep feeding the world. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we will be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. We have more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agnet West headlines, here's Brian German. The Department of the Interior has unveiled an updated roadmap for solar energy development in the West, aiming to expand solar production in more states and streamline renewable energy siting and permitting on public lands. The Bureau of Land Management also announced progress on various renewable projects in Arizona, California, and Nevada, representing over 1,700 megawatts of potential solar generation and 1,300 megawatts of potential battery storage. The BLM's updated Western Solar Plan seeks to allocate approximately 22 million acres for solar application. The plan enhances predictability for developers while considering site-specific resource considerations and incorporates $4.3 million from the Inflation Reduction Act. Public input can be submitted through April 18th and will help to inform a final programmatic environmental impact statement and record of decision. The Innovative Practices for Soil Health Act of 2024 has been introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives. The bipartisan legislation aims to enhance U.S. Department of Agriculture conservation programs, facilitating the adoption of perennial systems and agroforestry by farmers. The act emphasizes support for high-impact perennial practices through the National Resources Conservation Service programs and establishes four national and regional agroforestry centers. It also seeks to standardize terminology and definitions to improve consistency in the implementation of sustainability practices, as well as making greenhouse gas reduction planning an eligible conservation activity within the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Supporters of the bill describe it as having the capacity to unlock critical incentives for farmers and ranchers, which would be a win for producers looking to continue building soil health throughout their farms. California snow levels have improved but are still behind the historical average. Sean de Guzman from the Department of Water Resources provided the latest readings from the second manual snow survey of the year. Our survey today recorded a snow depth of 29 inches and a snow water content of 10 inches. This results in 58% of average to date. And in comparison, our statewide snowpack is 52% of average based off of our automated snow sensor network. Even though the storms during January slightly helped out our snowpack, we're only about halfway of where we should be for this time of year. Most of the storms we've had this year have been on the warmer side, meaning that that rain snow transition line has been creeping up further and further compared to years past. This time last year, the snowpack was at 214% of average, and we were actually standing on over seven feet of snow here at the Phillips Station snow course. UC Cooperative Extension's hosting an irrigation and nutrient management meeting in Salinas in the coming weeks. CCA and DPR continuing education credits have been requested for the meeting that will be taking place February 20th at the Ag Center Conference Room in Salinas. The event will begin at 8 a.m. with a presentation on managing runoff during the growing season and winter, followed by an update on using higher carbon amendments for reducing nitrate leaching, and using satellite estimates of crop water use on the Central Coast. 
After the break, there will be a discussion about ag order requirements, the UC a r Nitrogen and Irrigation Initiative, and how to use CropManage to help with ag order compliance. There will also be a demonstration of pump efficiency and variable frequency drives after lunch. More information on the meeting is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Ag producers are increasing their efforts to directly sell their goods to customers as one way to address changing consumer preferences and what specifically they're demanding. Rod Bain reports. It perhaps is among the top economic concerns ag producers face or have always faced regarding their commodities. Yet Iowa State University Extension economist Chad Hart points out how to generate demand is a recent focal point for several farmers. It's always been a game where with the farmer you wear many hats. But it used to be one of those hats was not, I have to worry about connecting with the consumer. Now it definitely is. That has been due in part to recent shifts in consumer interest and preferences in purchasing food and farm products. Scott Brown of the University of Missouri provides the example of consumers and meat purchases, both before and emphasized during the COVID-19 pandemic. Understanding we're chasing a consumer that's changing in that we no longer go to the grocery store and look at the meat case and say, is it chicken, pork, or beef that's cheapest? It's which restaurant do I pick that tends to be that center of plate protein? One approach to improve demand is through direct marketing by producers. Everything from roadside farm stands, stores and displays in nearby retail shops, online sales, and transactions between farm and local institutions. And Chad Hart says that younger farmers and ranchers are embracing direct marketing with the mindset of such entrepreneurs being... Do not wait in sort of a field of dreams thing. If we build it, the customers will come. They went out, developed, cultivated those customers, treated their customers, if you will, like they're another crop, and found ways to build that market. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we'll be back in just a moment. We've run out of chill. This is California, dude. We invented chill. No, man. I'm talking about chill. Pistachios need chill to grow. Wait, what? Pistachios, man. They're in trouble. Not enough chill this winter means the dudes won't pollinate the dudettes in the spring. Oh, right. Guys, take a chill pill. Dormex has got this. Dormex plant growth regulator stimulates bud break and synchronizes bloom. It helps increase yields by overcoming the chill deficit. Growers who've used Dormex the past two years have seen higher pistachio yields, a difference that's measured by truckloads. Save the pistachios. Act now. Reserve your Dormex. Applications begin around Valentine's Day and wrap up around the 1st of March. Great, man. I'm stoked about the Dormex. This year, use the bud-breaking, yield-increasing power of Dormex on your pistachios. Dormex is a restricted-use pesticide. Always read and follow... Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. We go back to Brian German for this week's almond update. In today's specialty crop news brought to you by the Almond Board of California. You can find them online at almonds.com. In the latest marketing bulletin from the Almond Board, Kath Martino, ABC's Europe and Strategic Communications lead, talks about a QR code initiative aiming to redefine consumer interaction with the almond industry. And this QR code is different. It's not an ordinary QR code. It's it's a work of art. And let me tell you a bit about the, the motivation and the inspiration for where this came from. It was an idea that was born in Europe. We were doing um, focus groups. We were speaking to members of the public in Italy at the time. We wanted to understand more about what makes them tick when they buy their food. Are they thinking about where their food has come from in addition to how healthy it is for them? So we were in Milan and we were walking through the city after doing focus groups with consumers one day. And we quite literally stopped in our tracks. We saw on on a wall, it was a mural of a QR code that had been painted. And it was for a European paper stationery company. That's kind of irrelevant. The point is they'd used a really creative technique to tell their story. And we stopped and we were like, huh, what's, you know, what's this? It's interesting. It's clearly an ad for something. It had something in Italian underneath it, which when we translated it on Google Translate, it said, scan me. So we did because it had piqued our interest. 
And it took us to a website about the stationery company. It was trying to sell us their products, but it had got our attention. And that's what's important is getting a consumer's attention. So it got us thinking about, hmm, how can we do something similar to tell what is actually a pretty complicated story? How you grow almonds. You know, it's not, it's not an easy story to tell, particularly knowing that some people like to go deep. They, they, you know, they want to know the ins and the outs. And you can't do that in an ad, right? That's a difficult thing to do. Similarly, in, in a piece of editorial, in a newspaper article, a bit easier to go into detail there, but you don't have control of that story. And we want to have control of that story. So the creative juices started when we were in Italy. When we got back to the US, the idea was really born. And we thought we could steal this idea, essentially, and find an artist to create icons of objects, things that you would associate with an almond orchard. And we wanted those icons, those objects, to tie in to the story that we wanted to tell. And the story that we want to tell always addresses what consumers care about. And what consumers care about with almonds is how much water do they take? What's the deal with pollinators? How about the waste? Is there any waste? So that was our jumping off point. So we started looking for an illustrator or for an artist that could create some of these icons to help us tell that story pictorially, just using visuals. And funnily enough, we found an illustrator who is European, based in the Netherlands, called Darling Clementine, very whimsical. And we wanted something whimsical. We wanted something that was timeless and that would have broad appeal. So we started working with these people, I don't know, back in the summer. And it was a three-month process from briefing through to actual delivery of this artwork. And then, of course, our technical people had to work with it and actually make this thing work because you have to be able to scan this, right? And when you scan it, it takes you through to the Almond Board's Growing Good pages where you can read everything to your heart's content about how almonds are grown. So essentially, it's a really simple storytelling technique to tell what is a pretty complicated story. Right. But it's so important because in this day and age, with so many messages coming at us from just our phone alone, uh, how do you break through that noise and get somebody's attention? It's it's a clever way to do that. Uh, do, do we have any sense of the analytics of like how many people are actually checking this out when they see these pieces of art? That's a, that's a great question. So we started, let me tell you how we're using this thing. So we created it. Now we have to get it out there in front of people. We need eyeballs on this. We want to have the same effect on consumers here that the QR code in Italy, in Milan, had on us. So we're using it in out-of-home advertising in California. We're using it in San Francisco. It's appearing um, at transit shelters because we want... We want to have this in places where people are hanging out, waiting for buses, waiting for trains. Airports is another place. So we're using this at the moment. It is live in Sacramento Airport, in Oakland Airport. So when you're grabbing your coffee or your glass of wine, you can kind of kick back and scan, read. And people are doing that. People, you know, it's early days. And I don't have exact figures. The last time we checked, hundreds of people are scanning this. But it's very tricky getting data on something where no, there is no benchmark because this is new. We've talked to the out-of-home advertisers who sell us the space. You have to buy space, right, when you're, when you're advertising out-of-home. So we asked them, what kind, of, what kind of benchmark can we expect? What does success look like in terms of people scanning? And they, they said, huh, we'll have to get back to you on that because this is new. This is atypical. You don't normally get an out-of-home advert that solely features a QR code. Sure, a lot of ads have a QR code in the corner. And for that, the general benchmark success is 12%. Ours, I don't know. I don't know what success looks like. I'm not sure what I'm expecting success to look like. But that's all I know is that it's out there. It looks good. And we're getting some good anecdotal feedback from people. And we know from the, the numbers so far that people are looking at it and people are hanging out on our website when they click through. That's so cool. Yeah, because you're right. The, those types of advertisements haven't traditionally had a direct response type component to them. There just hasn't been that option. And so this is really a novel way to, to do that. That is really cool. Yeah, and it, we're learning. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the hope is, I, I would I would guess, you know, that those that are looking for more information would find, you know, the good information that we have available for them uh, to to help them make better form, informed decisions about almonds. Absolutely. And the other great thing about this QR code is even if you don't click through, you get a message from that. It's green for a start. That was deliberate. Those colors are very earthy. They're very natural. And it suggests good. So that's what we wanted. To, we wanted people to look at that. They see the words California almonds and they think good. And that's a subliminal message. And that's what advertising is about, right? It's about planting a subliminal seed in your mind. I look at that and I think California almonds, good. And these icons are things that you would you would associate them with the environment. You would associate them with sustainability, with responsibility, whatever word you want to use. So even if you don't scan through, and actually scanning through was a secondary objective in terms of how we measure the success of this thing, it's out there. People are seeing it. They're in high footfall areas in, you know, in the Bay Area and in airports. So we're, we're confident that this is a really neat way of, of telling this industry's stewardship story. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I'm on the road this week. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Cultiva Cuticle Masterclass. And I'm joined now by Cultiva Market Development Manager Brian Tipton to tell us more about the event. All right, so we are here in Las Vegas at the Cultiva office. And I want you to start out by telling us what we're doing here and what is the um, event that you're putting on for a couple of days. Sure, sure. So we call it our, uh, the Cuticle Masterclass is what we're, we're calling this event. And we're doing it uh, basically to, to bring more education and awareness to uh, our technology, SureSeal technology, um, which uh, our commercial product is Parka that's based off that technology. And there are, we've brought in um, grower PCAs, growers, uh, uh, different experts from around the country. Some have used our product, some have not, or are just getting, you know, just looking into it. But we've brought them in just to give them more of an education on the cuticle. What, what, what is the cuticle? What's its function? Why is it important? And then, um, you know, how is our product as a cuticle supplement um, helping to, to boost what the, the plant is already doing for itself? Mm -hmm. So I have to admit to you, I, I had to do some research before coming out here on those things that you just said. What is the cuticle? What is its function? What does it do? Um, because I didn't want to come out here knowing nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's not something that, I, and I've been covering agriculture news as we were talking off mic, I've been covering agriculture news for more than a decade. Yeah. And it's not something that I have heard discussed a lot. So tell me, how did this company come about and how did how did this product come about? Yeah, so so the, the company was, we founded the company in 2011. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, Oregon State University had developed the SureSeal technology to go for cherries, to be applied on cherries prior to rain events um, to, to, to prevent cracking. So rain, when it sits on the cuticle of a cherry, or I, I say cuticle now, but you call it scan or the surface of the cherry, um, it will um, cause splitting. And so what Oregon State wanted to do, um, and it was basically, uh, there was their um, uh, a formulation chemist who was in their um, uh, pharmaceutical department and an agricultural guy who said, hey, let's, they got together and they came up with uh, what is now SureSeal technology and basically to supplement the cuticle of the cherry. And so it was a spray, they needed a sprayable product that was natural. You know, they had all these different checks and SureSeal uh, checked all those marks and they sprayed it. And sure enough, we were seeing, or they were seeing a reduction in cherry cracking when they applied prior to these rain events. And so Cultiva was formed um, to um, acquire this technology. And so from there, you know, when we first started the company, we thought, okay, how many cherries are there in the world? And you know, how, how, where, you know, where are we gonna be applying this? As time went on, we, we, and, and we started working with different researchers, we found that it's, 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 it's not just what Parker and, and SureSteel technology are doing, it's, it's how it's supplementing that cuticle. It was, they had mimicked the cuticle much better, I think, than they even thought they did. And so um, 
uh, other researchers were saying, well, what if we try it here? What if we try it there? We're seeing issues, you know, skin issues. So russet on apples, you know, for instance, uh, different fruit finishes issues on different crops all go back to the cuticle. And so that's where we started looking at different, different, uh, different crop segments over time, putting money into the research to look at those crop segments and realizing that it's, it goes a lot farther than just cherry cracking. So what are some of the other crops? Um, I could start today. I would say right now our main crop focus that we've been looking at are apples, mm -hmm. cherries of course, uh, table grapes, starting to look at wine grapes, uh, blueberries, uh, pomegranates, citrus, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, avocados we're just starting to look at, we're looking at strawberries, uh, we're looking at leafy greens, so romaine, le different lettuces and that, as well as some of the um, uh, broccolis, um, I, I'm trying to think, uh, let's see, sorry, I apologize. Anything for tree nuts? Yeah, actually, um, we are, we've looked at almonds, walnuts, uh, pistachios as well. And we're, we're seeing efficacy there. Um, you know, I think where it comes down to is we also want to make sure that we have a return on the investment to the grower. I mean, if they're gonna invest in our product, we wanna make sure that they're getting something out of it mm -hmm. that's, that's making them money. And, you know, the, the nut crops in recent times have, have, have been difficult. You know, they're not making as much money as they have in the past. And so um, we do see a yield boost by using parka, mainly from retention of the nut um, on those trees and 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 they are showing uh, it is showing that we're, we're giving these growers return but um, you know when everybody's looking at taking things out trying to add something in it's just the process is slower to adopt in those crops you know and you I'm gonna use your words against you here in a friendly way <laughs> um, <laughs> you talk about when everybody's taking stuff out it's hard to add something in mm -hmm. and this is a difficult time right now just uh you know in the business environment right to have a product that you're trying to get the word out about you know you're bringing more focus to that you're expanding and that you're spending money on research and development for um and and part of the answer to that i believe correct me if i'm wrong is the type of event that you're doing now where you have brought people in from around the nation from these specialty crop areas around the nation right to learn more about it is are you finding like success with that are you excited about this we are and you know again going back to what the cuticle does i mean the cuticle is the first line of defense for a plant as well as the fruit so that's the other thing we got to think about that the plant has a leaf cuticle uh you know the fruit has a fruit cuticle, fruit cuticle so it's all impacted by the technology and over time i mean we all hear about it global warming you know uh, environmental change you can call it what you want um, but we're our environment's changing and that environment is impacting the way that uh, um, these growers are um, dealing with it, you know, what they have to deal with compared to, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So, you know, when we first started the company, I mean, a, a product like ours probably wasn't as appealing as it's become now because, um, you know, these crops have to adapt to these environmental changes. And the first line of defense to be able to do that is the cuticle. And so that's where it's it's making that's where we're having our impact so when you look at why are people interested why are they here why are they looking at that it's because they're dealing with these environmental changes and there's not a lot of answers and i think that our, our technology is an answer for them it's a tool that they can put in their um, tool chest that can help them adapt to these environmental changes we're talking with cultiva market development manager brian tipton and we will continue the conversation right after this Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I am in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Cultiva Cuticle Masterclass, and I'm joined by Cultiva Market Development Manager, Brian Tipton. You know, it was so interesting when I was doing my research, and I was researching off of your website, and um, to see how this, how protecting the cuticle works on different um, problems, let's say. So, right. in fact, one of the things that we'll be discussing tomorrow during the, the Fruit Summit is um, managing drought and drought stress, mm -hmm. but then also um, extreme colds. And so those are things that happen in different parts of the nation. So, right. you know, our California growers who, who are listening to this interview uh, deal so much with drought stress. Right. And so learning about a product like this that can help protect their fruit from the damage caused by that. Right. But at the same time, our listeners in Michigan who have to deal with these cold spurts, uh, again, protecting the cuticle of the fruit, but I, you know, from what I learned, can help with that at the same time. So mm -hmm. it's 
versatile almost in its protection. It is, and I mean, that's that could be a catch-22 for us because it sounds like, oh, you know, this this technology can do everything. And we, we, Yeah, careful, right? Right. Which, yeah. Um, it, it doesn't do everything, first of all. Uh, second, um, you know, it, it comes down to, yeah, it can do, it, it, it is helping whatever the cuticle does. Uh-huh. So there's, a, you know, there's all these functions that the cuticle has. Parker's going to help enhance those those effects. Um, but then, you know, that's where a grower has to decide, am I getting that return that we talk about? Right. I will say that when you asked about the cold stress and the drought stress and the heat that they're dealing with, a plant, you know, we either take our, put on our jacket or we take it off. Right. A plant, when it has those stresses, it doesn't, it doesn't recognize the difference. The chemical reaction that happens within that plant is the same. So it's dealing with the stress, whether it's cold or hot, the same way. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever you know, gene expressions that's happened and what the plant, how the plant is dealing with it is the same. And we first started out looking at park on heat stress, this drought stress, you know, um, and that's where it went. And we've had some researchers say, well, if you're working on heat stress, you should work on cold stress because the plants look at it the same way. Oh. We didn't know. I didn't know that. You know, I'm not, I'm definitely not a PhD. <laughs> so, um, but they started looking at it. So actually we have a speaker here at our um at our at the cuticle master class who is from uc riverside that did did a study on looking at parkas used to help uh tolerance to cold and lo and behold it it had had some uh results that were positive and so we're going to continue to explore that but yeah I, i mean at the end of the day that cuticle is protecting it whether it's cold or hot right so that's it just very interesting i love the science behind that and the thought behind that uh, you know, it just goes to show again why, why agricultural research is so important. Very much, yeah. And, and there's, I mean, there's, I mean, we look at the cuticle again. You, you said you never really heard of it. You had, yeah. And so we're looking at an untapped, I guess, market. Really, I mean, we're the mm-hmm. only ones that have really focused that. There are more companies that are as as time goes on, and they see the success that we have sure. or having. I mean, of course, you know, you, you always want to be be in that group, right? But I, I would say that we've put more time and research into cuticle, understanding the cuticle, not just our product, but just understanding the cuticle and its impact on, on when the environment changes. That then how do we take our technology and apply it to those problems? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's really twofold. Our research sometimes doesn't even involve sure seal or parka. It's just understanding what, what's happening here yeah. and, and why. And then how can our technology then um, you know, work to, to negate that? that negative effect. Yeah. Well, I know that I need to let you go and I want to be respectful of your time, but I'm wondering, is there anything else that you really want our listeners to know either about the company or about your research, about the fruit cuticle? I think (laughs) all of it, yeah. I mean, um, for sure. At the end of the day, I mean, Park is here. Our slogan is all goes back to the cuticle. One of the things that we discovered when we were, you know, doing research in other crops outside of cherries, was it all just, again, the results we were getting all seemed to be something that was affected by the cuticle and the reason why we were seeing positive data was because of that so i think it you know uh what i would leave with is um is that we're we're continuing to do research on that and we will and we're we're having crop expand we're seeing crop expansion all the time i think there's a lot of utility for this technology in a lot of different areas not only crop segments but geographies as well all right thank you so much for your time you're welcome thank you and thank you for having us out here you bet that's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halverson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. AgNet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.